pioneer trailblazer, and he's got a really big uh, week coming up here in the Northeast. Tomorrow, in fact, has a sold-out show. Is it him? The War Master? Oh, my gosh. It's been yes. far too long. Yes, it has. How are you, sir? I am back. The legend. I'm here to see my Good management. To see you. Yes, please. <laughs> I still have it up there. Of course, but uh, uh, on the Twitter page. I don't even know if people even remember I don't know. everything yeah. behind that. They're like, what the hell is this? Yes, yes. They're like this here. guy yeah. with the bag and the. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed in the world since that photo. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Sometimes has. I wonder if it's even politically correct anymore. Well, if it isn't, it's that's just what makes it better. <laughs> yeah, that's why I keep it up. This yeah. is great. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. Uh, I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Um, how long have you been in the Northeast for? Like, because I know we're going to talk yesterday. about just as of yesterday. Okay, yeah. wow. Uh, and so I'm, I'm assuming the base is Philly, and you just kind of came mm -hmm. down for us. All right. Well, I appreciate that. What a week for you. What a, what a stretch for you. What a time for you. Like, mm -hmm. there's so much going on in your world. So specifically tomorrow, April fourth mm -hmm. in Philly, the show is sold out. Last yeah. I heard. Yeah, it's been sold out for over two months, maybe or a month. I, I forget, man. It sold out fairly quick. It's blood sport. That's yes. promotion. Um, I want to ask you what Bloodsport is, maybe for the audience that mm -hmm. doesn't know, but do you own Bloodsport? Uh, I am a part owner, okay. I would say, yeah. Who, who are the other parts? Uh, GCW. I do this with Game Changer Wrestling. Okay. Yeah. And what is Bloodsport? For, the, for someone that doesn't know what it is. Josh Barnett's Bloodsport is basically the rawest, hardest hitting type of professional wrestling you can find anywhere in the world. And when I mean raw, I mean stripped down. It is not so much about the gimmicks and the glitz and the glamour. I mean, it is a show and we put it on to, awesome. to draw people's attention and to get them to watch it and enjoy themselves. But what's behind the show is the wrestlers. This is a place where the wrestlers are able to shine and or fail you know, be it because we don't have a bunch of support structure around everything else. It is just the wrestler in the ring with, unlike you're going to see them anywhere else. These matches are won only by knockout or submission or referee stoppage, or possibly if somebody is exited from the ring because there are no ropes, no ropes. and cannot get back in within 10 seconds. Golly. And that's it. You go out there and you, you do your, you do your work. And so when you, um, so you've been involved for five years, it's been around for 10, correct? No, it's, uh, there was one show that, that they originally did with Matt Riddle. Mm -hmm. um, I forget if that was in 2018. Then Matt went to WWE. And so uh, Brett reached out to me about if I'd be interested in, in taking this whole concept over. And I said, yes, however, um, to do it, it has to be my show. I got to book it. I got to be the agent. I'm producing it. Like, I'm not going to have my name on something if I'm not fully hands on. And he said, okay. And from there we went and you could see from the very first show that I did um, in Jersey City with the main event being me versus Minoru Suzuki is a completely different animal. And in, so from that point on, we have just continued to advance this concept under my, uh, my vision here uh, and to, to make it as as close to I can and to constantly improve it from, from what I saw in my head from the very beginning. Yeah, and so tomorrow as well, you are competing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will be taking on John Morrison, now known as Johnny Bloodsport. Right. Yeah. He always changes his name. He always does. Yes. Uh, he is quite the character, but uh, don't get me wrong, it's serious business. Obviously, everybody who has seen John Morrison before um, knows he's a, a hell of an athlete, good-sized dude, and incredibly agile, agile in a way that a man his size should not be. But what they don't know is that he was an ex-collegiate wrestler. Um, if they've been following, he's also 1-0 in boxing with a TKO under his belt. Right. And um, he's undefeated in blood sport so far. He's 2-0. Correct me if I'm wrong. There was a bit of a, um, <clears throat> it was a surprise when he joined blood sport because I think people thought that he's not that kind of exactly. wrestler, right? A lot like when I brought in Anthony Corelli, mm -hmm. known as Santino Morella, mm -hmm. or Morello. And uh, people were like, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Is he pulling out the Cobra? Is he right. No, this guy shows up who has an international level judo background, fellow Canadian like yourself. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you could, you could root for him that way. Uh, trained by Yuki Ishikawa, trained in battle arts, pro wrestling, and he shows up and it's a completely different animal. And it's just to show that part of my fun with this with this concept is that I can grab these wrestlers that you think you know, you think you know who they are, and then put them in this environment and see them in a way that you have never seen them before and will, you will never see them, you won't see them anywhere else. Um, Nick Nemeth, who was Dolph Ziggler in WWE, a decorated D1 wrestler. Um, 
known in the WWE for a, a different kind of wrestling and a different kind of persona. When you see him tomorrow night, it will not be Dolph Ziggler. This is going to be Nick Nemeth. This is a person um, who's going to be drawing on from things that are inherent in them that were, I would say, probably restrained in WWE. There are no restraints in blood sport. This is not only is it about the wrestler being able to be themselves as much as possible, that means I'm not holding them back. So whatever restrictions they may have been from wherever they used to be, that's all gone. Chains are off. Locks are, are done. The padlocks are off to the side. Let it rip. So it seems like obviously you have a, a great fan base. The internet loves you mm -hmm. guys. Uh, you're a great part of the WrestleMania week. There's all these different shows. But I think a lot of eyebrows were raised when word got out that Shayna Baszler, student of yours, mm -hmm. right, um, was being allowed by WWE. She's still under contract with mm -hmm. WWE, still a, a, an important part of their of their roster, is going to be competing on, on your show tomorrow. How did you get this done? Uh, hopes and prayers, they actually did <laughs> line up for once. I have a relationship with the WWE and I have for some years um, with Shayna you know, being one of my athletes, but I, I've actually trained and worked with a lot of athletes that have had time in the WWE, like uh, Davey Boy Smith Jr., uh, Tim Thatcher, just to name a few. Um, and just through that communication, now just seemed to be the right opportunity. And they were completely amenable to sending her over and I was obviously overjoyed to be able to have my student and to have somebody that's a WWE talent in my show and, you know, blew up the internet because yeah. the, the, the accusation or the, the temperament was that the WWE is never going to work with indie promotions and there's never going to be any of these talent exchanges, but you know, it just goes to show you, I mean, you can't say never about really anything. This is the first time they say yes? I believe so. This is the first time anybody who is under contract is working with an independent organization. If somebody is a walking, talking, you know, encyclopedia about this, and you can tell me I'm wrong, go ahead. I'm not gonna hurt my feelings. But as far as I know, yeah, this is a first. If Vince McMahon is still in charge, are they saying yes? Uh, I don't know, Vince, but something would tell me that'd be an absolute no. Okay. In fact, uh, you know, I think uh, if Vince is still in charge, I think not much would change at all. And, you know, that, that's its own story, but he's not right. as far as it seems. And so the reason I bring that up is, is this maybe like a sign, you know, everyone keeps talking about the difference <laughs> between the, the Paul Levesque, Nick Khan, WWE. Mm -hmm. This seems like another sign that it is truly a different company. I, I think so. Um, but I think a lot of that also isn't just what the WWE does. Mm. It's what do, let's say in our case, what do we do? Do we show ourselves as being somebody that they can trust in, that they can work with, and that everybody can walk away happy, including the wrestler? Um, I intend to deliver on that, but I can't speak for any other things in the future that other people might do. And, you know, it's a lot to trust somebody with your contracted talent because it's not just that you have a contract on them, you're invested in that person. You put a lot of time and effort into them. You, you may or may not have plans for them, but you had enough belief in them to bring you on board. You're paying them a lot of money, and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with taking care of that person. So if you're going to lend them out somewhere, you got to think, you're not just giving them a person. You're giving them all that trust and that responsibility right. that, that they are taking upon themselves, the, the company, the WWE in this case. So you know, I don't treat it as a, a small or a trite thing or something that was even simple to do. So I'm, I'm really happy and honestly really proud to be able to have that kind of trust. How many people do you expect tomorrow? I don't know. You'd have to ask Brett. Okay. <laughs> uh, like, GCW. Um, uh, I've never seen the venue. He, he handles all that okay. venue stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess over a thousand. Okay. Yeah. And, and how many shows do you, do, like does blood sport put on? Cause I know you have one in June mm -hmm. in Japan. First one in Japan, right? Yeah. That's, that's another, uh, first. Actually, not just a first for us to bring uh, Bloodsport over, but uh, I was talking with uh, you know, some very uh, deep people in the know there, uh, Akira Maeda and some others, and I said, you know, I'm not familiar if a gaijin on their own started a, a company group in Japan and opened up with a show in Yogoku as their show. 
and people kind of sat around. Everyone I brought this up to me, go, I don't think anybody has done that. So I think uh, I may be a first for a foreigner to walk into Japan and put together a professional wrestling show, a Japanese professional wrestling show at a place like Ryogoku at this size. And uh, the only thing I can say is the, the reason that that is even possible is just because of the relationships that I've cultivated over the years and just the goodwill and, and good standing that I have with not just wrestlers and managers, but also with a lot of these companies that we talk to and we work with as well. And I'm, I'm always happy and even surprised when somebody is like, absolutely, 100%, would love to do this with you, uh, we're, we're, we're on board. Because I never expect that anybody should necessarily owe me anything. Mm. I'm always happy when the opportunities can, can work out. And I want to make sure that because of those opportunities, and when they do work out, that they work out for both of us. Everybody leaves happy. That's in June, right? June 22nd, Yogoku Kokugi Con. And so far, we haven't announced uh, matchups or even the entirety of all who's going to be performing on the card. But... <laughs> but yeah there's one name on there that jumped off the, the page when i saw it <laughs> which one is it because there's quite there's a, a couple for me personally it's rampage jackson yes. my old friend rampage gonna do this yes he is rampage had a cup of coffee i think back in the day was it with tna tna and i think in as he told me in retrospect it was a lot tougher than he mm -hmm. thought it was going to be tito said the same yes and so i'm just wondering if there's any part of you that's like does rampage know what he's getting into here because this isn't when you know, I first brought it up to him, uh -huh. he was thinking along those lines. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, look, buddy, I, I got this thing I'm putting together over here, and I think you'd be perfect for it. And he's like, oh, man, uh, do I have to do this? And is it going to be like that? And I go, just relax. Trust me. <laughs> uh, you know, you trust me enough to, to get out there and punch each other in the face as, as training partners and let me train you for some fights. So this will be a lot easier than that even. I'm not going to punch you in the face at all. Mm. I show him a highlight and I just get text after text like, you gotta be kidding me, oh my God, this is, oh, this is, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, this is absolutely perfect. And I go, y y I wouldn't ask you to be a part of something if I didn't think you were capable of delivering. And when I mean delivering, he's Rampage Jackson. You know, he's a former UFC champion, pride superstar. Like he's fought in all these different places all over the world. He's been top of the heap. I'm not gonna put him in something that I don't think is a is a place that he's going to shine. Okay. So it's you know my pleasure to have Rampage there. But oh, that's great. Uh, bringing in Japan. him along into Japan, it, a place he's very well and familiar right. with. It's going to love seeing him Who's out his there. His opponent? I haven't released it yet. Okay, TB. You know, no better time than now. Nah, nah now is not the time. Okay. We have uh, we have plans to release those names at a certain point. Okay. But uh, now is not it. Although I would love more than anything to do it here. But I can say that uh, we've got myself. We've got Rampage Jackson, Minoru Suzuki. Uh, Mike O'Hearn, mm. bodybuilding legend, yes, uh, who also actually has a background in judo and has trained in professional wrestling before. Has he ever had a match, a televised match? I don't think he has. Okay. But uh, we have seen him before on the American Gladiators reboot and yeah. Battle Dome. And if anybody remembers that, it was probably a highlight reel of Mike O'Hearn absolutely demolishing people. Like mm. he just would slaughter people on these shows. It was so unfair. So putting him in the blood sport ring just seemed like a natural fit. And he's basically family. Like uh, my brother-in-law and him grew up as kids playing football and training and lifting. And then they were powerlifting together on the same team and everything. So I've known Mike since I was a young dude. Um, we've also got Davey Boy Smith Jr., mm. who is very well and familiar with competing in Japan. Uh, he has won catch wrestling tournaments and grappling tournaments as well. He is a blood sport veteran and a big mountain of a man. We have Masakatsu Funaki, former king of Pankrace. We have uh, to match with myself and uh, Minoru Suzuki as king of the Pankrace. So there's three of them on this card. Wow. Not four, three. Yes. <laughs> uh, then we also have David Madmoshvili, uh, Olympic silver medalist in freestyle wrestling from Georgia. Golly. A beast of a man. And, uh, you know, the point of blood sport is to find the baddest, toughest, you know, most driven people in the world that are capable of getting in that ring and putting it on the line. And I feel like a person like uh, David is perfect for this. And, you know, uh, he will find himself in good company with people like myself and Rampage and uh, Kazushi Sakuraba. Golly. Is this his first time on a Bloodsport card? Yes. Wow. That's incredible. And, you know, one of the advantages of doing a show like Josh Barnett's Bloodsport Bushido over in Japan is it makes it a lot easier for me to access this Japanese talent and bring them mm -hmm. to the ring. 
And this I, is you sick. Know, I, I live for that. And, kind of and thing. you can watch uh, the event tomorrow and the one in June on TrillerTV.com. Yes. yes. Formerly well, known as Fight TV. I just know it as Fight TV all the yes, time. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, but yeah, we will be um, available on Fight TV uh, for both of these uh, with Bloodsport X being on uh, Triller Plus okay. and uh, Josh Barnett's Bloodsport Bushido being a, a pay per view option. You're the perfect person to speak to right now for so many different reasons. Not only because you have this great show tomorrow, mm-hmm. but is, um, is, it, is it my my lovely? Well, beard? you look great. It's my, been a while since I've seen you. No, but you know, uh, you're talking about this pro wrestling mm-hmm. stuff, and you're talking about names like Sakuraba and mm-hmm. Rampage competing on your show in June. And I'm sitting here, Josh, and I'm doing a show called the MMA Hour, mm. and there are some fans who get upset when the <laughs> likes of CM wrestlers. Punk, CM Punk. One of the biggest interviews you can get in combat sports right now, or yeah. Cody Rhodes, yeah. or Becky Lynch, come on, like how dare! And I've been dealing with this because I'm openly a pro oh, wrestling I fan. It. I see it. I see it. They probably give you crap about darts too. Uh they're crazy. They do, but it's just crazy to me because you're the guy. You're the guy who is a legend, UFC champion, fought all over the world, MMA, but also continuously dabbled in this world. And I've said time and again, the roots of MMA are in the world of pro wrestling. If there wasn't a pro wrestling, there is no MMA. Mm-hmm. Can you please explain to these noobs, to these individuals, <laughs> why MMA uh, and pro And by the way, yeah. the irony now is UFC and WWE under the same umbrella, right, for goodness sakes. Yes. yes. But explain to these people why these two entities are so much more linked than they think. Well, for one, stop being ahistorical, youngsters out there. Like There are things that happened less than two years ago. <laughs> right. Right? Uh, but... At the same time, and, and by the way, it makes all this much more enjoyable if you do know the history and the backstory on these things. It gives so much more rich complexity and spirit into the entirety of it all, including MMA. What is professional wrestling but combat sports? And I have always said that professional wrestling and, and shooting, which is the, you know, real fights, like, uh, or I should say you know, non-predetermined matches, mm-hmm. like the UFC, are just two si- one side of the same coin. You know, one side, you've got your shoots, one side you got your works. And there is no real difference. And back in the day when you were trained to be a professional wrestler, I'm not even going back to the days where pro wrestling was a totally shoot, legit uh, style of competition. If you were an amateur wrestler and you were good enough, you might actually be, be able to become a professional wrestler, say in the 19th century or very early 20th century, and go out there and wrestle under a variety of, of different rule structures that could happen because judoka were coming over. So you might put a guy in a jacket or a gi top for one match, then the next match you take it off. And people like Ad Santel would travel all the way over and competed in a catch wrestling versus judo uh, event over in Japan at uh, Yasukuni Shrine. You know, this is even where the, the term no holds barred comes from. Catch as catch can, which would become and be known as professional wrestling, meaning that no holds were barred. All strangles were legal, all leg locks, all everything. And not to mention you had all in, which was where you could strike and hit and, and headbutt and all of that. So MMA, combat sports, is, is the oldest thing in the book. And wrestling being the oldest sport that anybody has done and does everywhere in the world. Every culture has a wrestling of some sort. So combat sports is just inherent in human beings. It's inherent in animals. It's inherent in just everything on the earth, just about. Pro wrestling is the thing that paved the way for the way we view combat sports today, especially with what New Japan Pro Wrestling was doing by bringing over Carl Gotch, by Antonio Inoki, building this kind of uh, all-rounded type of athlete for professional wrestling incorporating eventually Muay Thai strikes and Karate and Sambo and building upon that catch wrestling base that you eventually get Shuto, which was the first modern uh, MMA company in the world. And then Pancrase, who had their event before the UFC did. Then the UFC coming along. Then us seeing what was happening in Brazil and that coming up. And this thing all growing and growing and having all these little different tribes all over. And eventually, as things do, you know, we get some uh, centralization, so to speak, with the UFC becoming the biggest name in the game. Uh, but nonetheless, we're not fighting just simply to be the best in the world, or that could be our motivation as athletes, but the entirety of what our job is, is to fight for the entertainment of the fans. And what is pro wrestling other than that? 
Because mm. if the fans aren't showing up, then there is no UFC, there's no PFL, there's no any of this, and there's no Ryzen, there's no company to support putting you in the ring and putting money in your hands because there's no audience. And you know what? That is a thing that I'm still, when I started on this path in 1996, 97, I didn't necessarily think I was gonna become rich or famous. I never envisioned the type of exposure that MMA has to this degree these mm -hmm. days. But I didn't care because that wasn't the point. But I always knew um, that this was pro wrestling of a sort. I was always a big pro wrestling fan, big martial arts fan, and just had an absolutely overwhelming desire to go out there and smash people. But I knew that it was going to be in front of an audience. And if it wasn't an audience, I was still going to fight them. But ultimately, that's how you know you've made it. When people find what you do compelling enough, they're going to give up their hard-earned money to see you do it. So I'm so happy that you keep stressing audience because these days I get very fired up when I see these shows in front of no people. There, you know, one third yeah. of the UFC events are in an empty warehouse with like uh, 30. The Apex. Yeah. And I've got Victor Henry fighting. Uh, yes. April 27th. April 27th and it's yes. an Apex show. And doesn't it, this is not why we fell in love with it. This is not good. No, right? And I, I'd like it if they could put a bit more production into it, make it at least look cooler. Maybe have a bit, if you're not going to increase the audience and uh, maybe they could have reasons for that, but do more to make it seem like it's important. Um, but doesn't it and, feel like a step back? Uh, this, is, this is like 1970s Portland wrestling in a studio. <laughs> that, like the UFC has already gone past this. There was a time where every weekend they were in a different city, yeah. same amount of shows but, all over but, the world. Look at the, the level of, or not the level, the amount of events they're having. I mean, personally- It's the same me, amount though. I would See, I would say that's the problem already. Oh yeah, that is- They should the be way yes, less events. I agree, I agree. There should be one night tournaments again. Oh, in my. fact, I think the whole <laughs> rule structure, not just the refereeing and judging, but honestly, the rule structure of MMA has to change because we've already gamed it. The system's gamed. How's, and, how so? Well, it's like five minutes has been figured out how to work that five minutes, stay mostly as a kickboxer, only score your takedowns when you need to. If you do score that takedown, you know they're just getting right back up again. So it's really not even about establishing any control on the ground. Look at, when you look at submission work anymore, it's essentially uh, sleeper holds, mm. rear naked chokes, if you wanna use that terminology, which comes from judo, by the way, uh, Ude Hidakajime, rear naked strangle. But um, the thing is, one, five minutes is not enough time to really get anything up and established. And the reason why the, the sleeper is the, is the finish you see the most is because it all comes off from getting hit. Someone gets dazed, they, they start stumbling, you get on them, you take their back and you choke them. Or you get on top, you warn them out, you start punching them, they turn, you choke them. It's not take down, set them up, take their back and choke them just clean. That's really rare these days. And it's almost as if the submission aspect of MMA has, especially at the highest levels, because you... Once you get to the UFC, you lose one fight, you can be cut. So a lot of people are really disincentivized to really open it up. Sometimes mm. they'll do it anyways because they figure like the, the bigger and the wilder the fight, the more potential for getting a bonus check is. Uh, but there's no guarantees there. And, and not like I'm asking that there should be, but um, it's, I think like if you're gonna give someone a contract that you should invest in them a little more than that. But, uh, but you know, it's not my show. But nonetheless, the system, you watch like a lot of these events now and it's like, oh, this is just basically a kickboxing match. This is a kickboxing match. Right. This is a kickboxing match. They're great fighters, Adesanya and uh, 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 um, uh, the Brazilian cat. Um, uh, uh, Ox Pereira. Pereira. Yeah. They're, they're great fighters. But watching their first and then their second fight and people be like, this is the greatest MMA stuff. These are the greatest MMA fighters. Like they're not MMA fighters. They kickbox, they kickbox the whole time. Mm. Like I just saw no MMA work. I saw nothing but the same thing they would do in glory, but with smaller gloves. Mm. Why, <laughs> why not just fight them in glory? Obviously because there's not as much money, notoriety, whatever. And they've managed to make their style work well for them. That goes to show you what capable, competent athletes they are, what good coaching they have. And just, you know, they're game dudes. And personally, I don't care that um, either one of them have knocked each other out. None of them are diminished in my eyes. They're great fighters and they'd be tough for anyone to deal with. But I think if the rounds were longer, people were starting to put more emphasis on takedown work and control, 
uh, and being really heavy handed about stand ups, not standing up people quite as much, definitely being really vicious about fence grabs to get back to your feet or to stop takedowns. Um, I don't think, I think it would be, they wouldn't have quite as much success. They'd still be top of the heap because they're just that tough, but I think you would see a different a different shakeout in the fighter structure that there is today. And I think you need more time to do that. Like what, think, 10 minutes? Yeah, I think at least 10 minutes. Wow. And I think, um, you know, putting knees to the ground, ground of opponent at the very least, which would help people like Adesanya and Pereira, but it would help grapplers too. It helps everybody. Um, and open and not open scoring, but uh, pride styles, total fight scoring oh, makes yeah. way more sense than guys going out there. I need to win a round and win a round and I've won the fight. Yeah. You know, as long as I don't get knocked out or anything, you know, too particularly bad, I want to fight. 10-9, 10-9, I'm out of here. 10-9, 10-9, 10-9, oh, I can kind of coast these last two. Sometimes it'll bite people in the ass, most of the time it doesn't. And, uh, you know, the weight cutting thing, that needs to be completely eliminated. You know, it needs to be same day weigh-ins. It needs, you can- Wow, you can these are radical out. changes. Of course, because it's been gamed. And if I wanted to watch people at 170 pounds fight each other at 190, then why don't I just make it 190? Right, right. You know, it's just pointless. And you will see that, CTE would go down without weight cutting. Mm. Injuries would reduce. I mean, you're pulling all that water out and we already know you can't get it all back in your system. Well, there's less water in the brain and that's a scientific fact. They've done studies. So you're gonna get more concussions and you're gonna get more, more potential bruising and calcification of the brain from it hitting even harder because there's less cushion up there. Now imagine that water is not in your joints and ligaments like it was. Now you're gonna see more injuries in terms of people dislocating or tearing ligaments, dislocating limbs, all this kind of stuff, because they're just, all the things that are there for the, the health of the structure have been depleted so that you can make a weight class and go in there and fight at a weight you didn't weigh in at. How do you feel about the officials? Because you know we were just talking about um, with Chris Weidman, his fight on Saturday, mm -hmm. there were all kinds of eye pokes. Your guy, Victor Henry, who's fighting April 27th, protege yours, last time out, got nailed and then told he didn't get hit in the ball yeah so well i think ultimately i think to start off with is not an easy job yeah to have to be an official at all it's tough and the good ones should be you know the good ones should be praised for being good and they won't always be perfect and that's okay but uh it's a difficult job and it's often quite thankless and usually the only feedback you get is negative mm -hmm. so it takes a certain type of character however there are plenty of people in the world of MMA that don't belong there, that are not credentialed enough, that don't really know their ass from a tea kettle, and <laughs> they don't have any business right. deciding the livelihoods of these fighters. There's there's a, a push to have more former fighters be in these spots, judges, refs. That doesn't necessarily, I mean, sure, I think that would be a good start, but that is not a guarantee of good right judgment uh, in terms of what criteria are, are being uh, settled on, right? Um, it takes a lot more than just knowing how to get into a ring and fight to sit back and be a neutral observer, uh, checking against the criteria you've been giving and give the best, most objective take that you can. It's a very difficult job. I've done it. I've, uh, I've refed, I've judged, um, hell, I've not just with blood sport. I've been a matchmaker. I've thrown right. fights before. I've done everything you can think of, and it takes a lot of effort. It's a, it's a very difficult job, but you want to do the absolute best you can because someone's livelihood is riding on this. And at least you could say the, the former fighters know what it's like to fight, know what a fight looks like, are very, very um, adept at understanding the skills and the skills being employed, but also they know what it's like, what's on the line. And I know how important it is to get that win, especially if the, any of the pay structure is, is decided on win, win, uh, win, I hate and, that. win and, uh, guarantee and win bonus. Yeah. You know, um, that's half your money. It's a big deal. So and that, and that you know, we could argue about what would be a better system or what have you, but that is the way it is. And so you don't want to go out there and make a really bad call. Uh, or be negligent, really, and cost somebody half of their potential paycheck. You know, that's a big deal. M massive MMA event, massive pro wrestling event. Which one are you watching? What what, what are you more of fan of and right you know now? What? It would really depend on how it's put together. Massive pride card. I'm watching that. Like 2024. Massive old school UFC card. I'm watching that. 2024. 
it, it depends on who's on it. Okay. You know, if it's a massive MMA card up against a massive blood sport card, I'm, I'm yeah. watching blood sport because I, I know how that's going to turn out. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, Recently, you know what I love about uh, this version of Josh Barnett? You're a bit of a combat sport nomad, if you will. Like mm. I see you pop up with these these one-offs. A lot of people aren't doing this, and it, it speaks to your versatility because you are a pro wrestler and an MMA fighter, to boil it down to its simplest terms. Um, your experience with AEW, mm -hmm. what was it like? You know, we had, we had CM Punk yeah. in on uh, Monday. Obviously, it didn't end well, and he had a lot of things to say. Yeah. Uh, and I know you just had one match, right, mm -hmm. at Wrestle Dream? Yeah. Uh, what was your experience like working with them? Uh, overall, it was positive, and it was good to have a chance to get in the ring with someone like Claudio, who I have a lot of uh, respect for, and a lot of, uh, I like the guy a lot. I think he's got a great high ceiling. He's a part of uh, my friend and uh, I guess you could say student, John Moxley's Blackpool Combat Club, which was also uh, headed by another friend of mine, William Regal. So I'm invested to see those guys succeed. And, you know, I wanted Phil to succeed when he was there, Punk. Uh, and all the people like Marina Shafir, who will be working, who will be on this blood sport card coming up tomorrow, uh, is also in AEW. So I have a lot of vested interest. But for me as a wrestler, you know, I can see things where I would do things differently or I feel like there should be more emphasis here than there. And it's a place that I think maybe maybe it's still growing pains or maybe maybe there just needs to be a bit of distance given to i don't know maybe tony or someone else so if they can get a, a better maybe a ten thousand foot view to make the proper decisions I, I will say that when it came to my match nobody had any input to guide me one way or the other it was just a match and they let us go out there and do what we were going to do um I, th I guess the only thing i would say is that the, the intent of that match was to put a test on Claudio to see where he's at, see where he can become, what he can become, because he, he has yet to see, I think, his greatest version of himself still. I think we're all kind of striving for that. Um, but yet, you know, I came out first. So the challenge just sits around in the ring and waits for the guy to show up. And I can't say that the music that was played is any I'd ever heard before. I know it definitely wasn't the song that I, I said is my entrance music. So will those seem like small things to that wrestler in that moment? Did they it's just a, get it wrong? It's a big, uh, I don't know what happened. Okay. Uh, you know, if there was a need for clearance, I could have got that. If there was a need for something else, I'm completely amenable to work with anybody, especially when I say I'm down to be there. But uh, those may seem like small things. To me, the wrestler on the moment, yeah, it's a big deal only in regards to me. To the entirety of the show, it probably doesn't even register. Right. But you have enough of that over time. Uh, you can get a lot of upset people. And if, let's say, enough things happen that could be noticeable to someone who's watching, well, then they might be able to pick at that and use that to say, well, here's where you're, you're screwing up. But, of course, they're not going to be uh, quite as... Um, uh, forgiving in the way they're going to do it, especially with the extremes we see when it comes to online discourse. You know, nobody uh. nobody really gets a gold medal for being sensible and rational. Yeah, the, the person that gets the most attention is the one that is saying the most obnoxious and hyperbolic stuff. So, you know, like anywhere, AEW has its its places it needs to grow. Uh, but I got along just fine with Tony. I was very happy with uh, basically every, all the way they treated me, and I would 100% go back in that ring, um, not just because it's AEW though, but because, you know, I'm the war master. Wherever there's a battlefield, you will find me. That is the reason for my existence. So you you build it, I'll be there. You ask for me to come and blood will be spilled. So I'm curious about this and uh, the, the AEW super fans will think that I'm picking on them. Of when, course, when, but you can't make everybody happy. But when, in reality, and I think you would know this because I've covered many of your fights outside of the UFC, I always root for the other promotions because I think it's better for the fighters and for the sport. Mm -hmm. MMA pro wrestling when there's competition. And I yes. think the reason why WWE is doing so well is because of AW and their threat. And the reason why the UFC product at times feels a little bit stale is because there is no serious competition here in North America. And so I ask you this question because you've been around the block and you've been a around a lot of big personalities in combat sports, perhaps no bigger than Dana White in terms of like mm -hmm. a presence, right? And so I have listened to a lot of people react to what CM Punk said, people who are legends in this business, Eric Bischoff and 
Conan and uh, what did Bischoff have to say? Uh, Eric, well, it was a lot of I told you so's. Oh, uh, he was very complimentary right. of uh, the interview. But I got I, into a, a row with him online. Did you? Because he somehow thought that my color commentary lacked uh, depth, that I wasn't going into uh, the deeper things that were happening. I'm like, dude, that's all I do. You know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I explain these holds. I make sure that everybody understands why anybody's doing exactly what they're doing. I, I talk about their their backgrounds and combat sports and other things. Was this for New Japan? Yeah, and I'm like, what are you watching? Are you just taking bad Reddit takes and and making a comment out of that? I, I did say something about Colin said he had a hair helmet, and there was a few things said back okay. and forth. But I'm not uh, trying to open that. No, can of worms. I'm not even look. I'm not sitting here saying like I got a problem with Eric Bischoff. I'm not. I found it all kind of humorous. And uh, you know, I don't have any problem with that guy. He could he could say whatever he wants, and and he could walk in here right now. I'm, I'm going to shake his hand. I don't got a problem with Eric. I just it was just Fair enough. interested. The reason I brought him up is because a lot of them say he isn't yeah a character that can be a boss. Tony, mm. do you need that guy in your opinion? Do you need that Vince character <laughs> who's imposing so that the wrestlers don't walk over him it backstage? It depends on what, con- what kind of company you want. How what do you want the landscape of that place to be? What do you want that environment to be? Um, and just because who you are works for a certain period of time doesn't mean that it's always going to work for all times. Uh, I think that you've seen that with Vince, there was a, clearly a period where, holy crap, whatever he was doing in wrestling, it was all gold. It was just nothing but eggs coming out the butt all day long, gold as could be, you know? Didn't even have to be at Willy Wonka's factory to do it. However, over time, you'd start to see uh, little things here, little things there, and then they would start to grow and grow and grow and grow. And I just, it's, you, you don't always necessarily have to completely evolve and change. I don't think it necessarily takes that, but sometimes you just need to nudge yourself a little bit one direction or the other to find where that perfect balance is because as you bring in these new people, younger generation people, they're gonna be different. You can't deal with them the same. And you can find people that may be more like-minded, but you, it's not one or two, it's you're dealing with the whole entirely different generation of folks. And when you become as big as like WWE does, or is, I should say, that's your roster increases in, in a massive way. Now there's all these more people to manage. And now with the advent of social media and all the other different ways in which you're gonna involve all these athletes in the public sphere, That takes a lot of different handling, takes more handlers in general. It just, everything's become more complex. So if you think you can do it the way that you did it in 1983, well, you can't. Um, That's not necessarily against you. That's not uh, a knock on the product or you as a person. It just means you got to find your way to make it work. And I don't know what Tony wants out of how his company to operate. You know, I'm, I can't speak for him. I know what I would do um, from what little I know about it. But then again, I have to admit, it's little. I don't have the experience that Punk does, and I'm not, I'm not Punk. I don't have the experience that, that Moxie does, and I'm not John. I know how Josh Barnett would run a company, and I know what I would do. Um, I know personally, if people get into a backstage row, I'm going to break it up, and then I'm going to say, look, do you really need to fight each other that badly? Okay, well, here we go. I'm going to set it up here. You're going to go for it. You know, this is a combat sports company. And if you lose, don't cry about it. And if you win, move on. It's over. You guys had your little fight, have fun. But did you get to the bottom of the issue? Are you going to do this again? Well, then what is the big problem? And can it be solved? Can it not be solved? Are you just going to keep fighting? Well, why don't we just put you in the ring and just fight on, t- and on camera? Let's just make money for each other then. Like, like a uh, shoot fight. Might as well, if that's what it's going to be. Could go off the rails, no? Could, could be, but I mean, look, it's the creation of their own design. Right. They're the ones with the problems. They can't solve them in this hypothetical. They can't solve them. They can't make it work. So, all right, cool. Well, and then I'll decide whether I keep you both or get rid of you both or keep one of them. But ultimately, you're going to make these choices and these actions. All I can do is guide, steer. I can either put the hammer down on it or at some point make a decision and be like, all right, you, you got your leash, you hung yourself with it, there you go, that's the end of it, and move on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not good to get too personally invested in a lot of these things and to really take it to heart. It's really more important to do whatever is necessary for the bottom line to make the company work the way it needs to, to have the spirit in the company that you want. And 
you don't want things that are going to be a distraction from it. But you also, in my opinion, you need to keep people behind the curtains and some people in front of the curtains. And that's when whatever happens in front of the curtains, you, you, you can account for that. Whatever's going on behind the curtains, you keep it there. And if there's something that can be used at some point, you, you use it, you distill it in such a way, and then you can put it in front of the curtain. But otherwise, it just becomes a bad soap opera, not a good one. And then people start getting slandered, people start getting these impressions or uh, attitudes towards them based on, you know, iceberg theory stuff. They see the tip, but they don't know all the stuff that's happening underneath. And that's not good either. And then it, being at pro wrestling, got to run with it. Whatever ends up out there in the world, I got to use it. Sorry, there it is now. Mm. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing. So if you think it'd be funny to do something in the ring and it, and it, get, and it gets over, plan to do it forever. <laughs> It's so like, be careful. Yeah, like the what chant. Yeah. Still, still living. I hate it. It's so annoying. It's so it's annoying, especially when there's something big happening. It's the worst. I, I'm, I'm dying to ask you um, about this particular no, please, person. Please, because no, no. I, I need you for a few more years at least. I, I, uh, Ronda Rousey has been in the news a lot uh -huh. as of late. Old friend of yours. She has a book out, mm -hmm. and she has talked a lot or written a lot about the end of her UFC run and her time in WWE. It's not a lot of, at least the excerpts that I'm seeing in the interviews, it's not a lot of positive stuff. Okay. Um, have you seen any of this? And, and if so, what is your reaction to some of the things that she is saying, uh, whether it's her time in WWE or the end of her UFC run? I've only seen a few excerpts about the end of her WWE run. And uh, um, it's a lot to ask anybody to become a professional wrestler and carry, main, be a part of main events and all that comes with it. It's not just about wrestling. It's about all the media and the press and everything. Same with, you know, uh, fighting in the UFC. It's a delicate balance where you can easily push someone way too far that now starts not getting positive returns in the long run. Um, you can also stress things to such a point that their performance starts to debilitate uh, or, or I should say um, uh, decrease. It's up to the, the, the wrestler or the fighter to speak up. But of course, I understand that there is a lot of um, uh, apprehension in doing so in terms of potentially upsetting the, your, your, the person that's paying your paycheck. Um, and I get that too. It's not an easy thing to do as uh, a fighter or a wrestler under the contracted uh, auspices of any of these companies. But, some, but you got to look out for yourself. And ultimately, um, I think that good bosses would understand that if you, if you approach it the right way, that you're not doing this to try and make everything easier for yourself just for the sake of it, but you're in fact on board with the process and trying to give the best thing that you can give to someone. And you know, at the end of the day, you can decide if you're the one calling all the shots that, okay, if I'm gonna use this person, maybe there's a bit of a cap on what I can do with them at this point. And that's completely acceptable. Like you shouldn't expect any and everyone to be able to, to do things at the highest level and to do it always over and over and over and over and over again. The guys and gals that can consistently live in that place are few. And there's a reason for it. Um, and sometimes those that can live at that highest level are capable of doing it at the expense of themselves over time. But, you know, when you're running it, unless you are aware of that, like, that's out of your control. If, if they're capable of, of always being that main event person and doing everything that comes with it, uh, even though they're burning themselves out, if you, if you can't notice it, then, you know, you're just going off of what they tell you. But, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that she had such negative experiences because in the end, I think the forward-facing aspect of it was, was positive things. Um, and even though I'm sure it sucks for her to see it, and maybe even to hear it, even making Holly Holm a star was still overall, in the grand scheme of MMA, a positive thing. Um, I'm not saying that it was good that she got knocked out or anything like that. It's just a part of being a professional fighter. They say if you're going to race cars and you have any, you're thinking about or worried about crashing, don't get behind the wheel. If you're gonna get in the ring, 
Don't be worried about losing. Don't be worried about getting knocked out. Don't be worried about getting submitted. You just go out there and you, you put your faith in what you've done and who you are and what you can do. And that's just what you go with. And some days, it ain't going to be your day. Uh, it could even just be a win, but a bad performance. But hey, man, that, that's it. You will have more. You will have more days and more, more times to go out there and do your thing if you do it right. And uh, these are high stakes, high pressure things. And when you get to the point where she was at her peak, people want to get every squeeze out of that as possible. And that can be a delicate situation. So in other words, like, do you agree? Uh, we had Becky Lynch last week and she's like, she just wasn't ready. Like she was pushed too quickly. Mm. She just wasn't ready. She wasn't fully trained. Well, she was hot at the moment. Like yeah. she was, she so, was, she so was, was that going. just like kind of revisionist history in a way? Um, at the time they had to do mm -hmm. that and may, maybe they you, didn't, when you're watching it, are you thinking, gosh, this is a little bit too much. She, I don't know. You know, I mean, it, 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 it was a, a turn on a dime moment. Yeah. Bang, got blasted in the nose. She did the, the exact right thing. The best thing that you obviously could have done because all of a sudden people were like, that's holy crap. I want whatever this is. This is, um, getting me involved in a way that I hadn't been before around this person. All right, I'm up, sign me up, put me, put me, uh, put me in line for this. And when the, when the, when the, when the fans are speaking like that, it's tough as the promoter to not be like, we got to deliver yeah. to some way that's going to keep them satisfied. Or I should say, almost satisfied. You never want to give them everything they want. You always want them to be still hungry for more. Uh, cause once they, if they get their full, they move on, you know, they push their plate, they push, their, right, push right. themselves away from the table and that's it. Now you want them to always be like, but what about one more bite? What about one more bite? That's the way you keep them going. Um, how'd but, you feel about that last match against Shayna? Um, knowing what I know about it. Yeah. It would have been a good idea to put, put the belt on Shayna, uh, especially at that moment. She had had such a coming out in what was it, the Elimination Chamber, just destroying everyone, and people believe it. You know, Everyone knows Shayna is a real fighter and was a top 10 bantamweight for the majority of her career. When she hits you, when she puts you in a submission, when she suplexes you, people are like, yep, I, I believe it. I'm, I'm, com I'm completely bought in. So I think it would have been a good opportunity, especially with Becky, if I remember right, wanting to slow down a little bit. But, uh, you know, I'm not the one pulling the levers there. I'm not the one looking at the books and I don't have the vision over the entire landscape of what they were looking at for the, division, the direction of the company as a whole and all their little separate entities that they had at the same time. All I can say is, yeah, and of course, I am also biased, so take it with a grain yeah. of salt. I would like to have seen Shayna run with that belt. I think she would have been a great champion for him. I think she still can be a great champion for him. Um, but... Yeah, Becky was the man. And hearing in retrospect all that was going on, it's it's interesting to know and you can feel for her. But uh, from just the outside looking in at, at the time, yeah, she was just, she was on top. And her persona was what people wanted and understandably so. And you could say, well, why, put the, why take the belt off? Or, well, she was gonna take time off for one. The other thing is, you are who you beat. Who's your opponent? Who are your rivals? That's what makes you the thing. That, that's what sustains you. That's what builds you up. That's what creates that interest and keeps revivifying you and what you're doing. So Shayna would have been a great, great person for that. Are you happy with her run in WWE? Yeah, they take great care of her. And the, the thing is, I feel like they really understand that she's incredibly versatile. You can put Shayna in and more silly stuff like she did with uh, Liv Morgan, she'll own it. She can do it. You can make her just do stick work. She can do it. You can put her as this mercenary that people are just paying off to go and cripple people before their matches. She can do whatever you line her up for. Her tag team with Zoe Stark, it's, or it's, you know, it's, it's got legs. They're a great pairing in terms of their wrestling capabilities and their physicality, but also they have a good dynamic and it's working. The thing is, wherever you put Shayna, it'll work. She can, she is like the, 
uh, Cordell Stewart. Mm, of, nice, uh, nice reference. Yeah, well, and we are in Philadelphia. Yes. Or we are in, well, technically well, the Pittsburgh Theater, but we're yes. in Pennsylvania. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, but she's a Cordell Stewart. That's of, a very 90s uh, the women's, reference. Uh, like the women's division. And she can uh, she can do it all. You know, or she's, Bo, or she's you know, Bo Jackson, so to speak. Another good reference. But with, a, with better. So, so are you in, <laughs> uh, in, in, in many respects. Uh, you were also on a KSW card mm-hmm. against Phil DeFreeze yes. in a grappling match. What was your experience like with KSW, who has a great product over there in in eastern europe and poland they're the they're the biggest european promotion out there yeah and it's unfortunate that the west isn't as aware of it but basically these guys see pride live yeah and they go okay we thought we knew what mma was we had no idea but we're gonna do that and i think they really succeeded with it i think they they did a phenomenal job with that ksw card that anniversary card and uh, they've only been like, the 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 easiest and, and very great to work with for me. Uh, I have a, a pretty substantial fan base over in Eastern Europe, and you know they've been able to take advantage of that. So have I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been on the cards. But uh, I've I've always been treated great, and I'm really excited to see them continue with their product. I love the fact that they've got really deep, uh, compelling. MMA fights that are properly ranked and, and structured, and they'll have fights with like, well, here's Marius Pujanowski versus, uh, God, there was this, like this Olympic lifter guy fight. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm down for that. I think yeah, that yeah. part of what it's was so much ass. fun of MMA is seeing these people like call them freak show matchups. I'm like, these guys are not necessarily freak shows. It's it's just like the stylistic differences. It, the, the what if is what drives you to want to watch it. If you knew all the structure of how the magic trick was done, are you gonna watch it? Or when all of a sudden David Copperfield says, you know, I'm gonna make an elephant turn into a wild boar, you're like, well, how the hell would you do that? And then drive this Bentley. You're like, what? Yeah. How'd that wild boar even get a license? Right. That's, That's only legal in <laughs> Arkansas, you know, and we're in Nevada. What the hell? Vegas isn't gonna let him on the streets, <laughs> but there he goes. He's in drive, that wild boar tusks out the window, there, he, and you're just like, I have no clue how this happened. By the way, David Copperfield, you can have that. Yeah, no, that's a great <laughs> one. Um, again, one of the reasons why I, I, I love talking to you is because you have such an appreciation for the history mm-hmm. of combat sports. I love to talk on this show uh, how there should be an MMA Hall of Fame, an independent MMA Hall mm-hmm. of Fame. That's not a knock on the UFC Hall of Fame. Yeah, I'm, the people keep going like, oh, we'll be at the PI or something. They're like, oh, you know, when are you going to be on this one? I'm like, never. Yeah. They're never going to put me on here. They wouldn't have any interest to, to have Why not? Why okay. not? You came back? You yeah, made amends? No, I have, uh, I just, there's just too much history. I Did you ever have a, like a, uh, just sort of a tete-a-tete to put all the cards on the table or no? Not really. I think, I think the thing that worked in my favor with, being in the UFC on the second run, and even just, I'd say, I'd say I'll start with that, is that it's funny, like talking to Ryan Grab back then, and he's like, oh, well, he was at Strike Force, yeah. or whatever. He's like, oh, man, you know, I, I heard that you, you could be you're hard to work with. And all this. I go, no, I'm not. What do you want me to do? Like, I'm 100% down, but if you, if you try to like hamstring me and cut me off at the knees, and ask me to do ridiculous stuff or what? Like, look, man, I'm a professional. I can do whatever it is you need to do. You don't treat me like the guy who just showed up, and we're good. And talk to me in a in a normal tone, and I'll give you more than you asked for every single time. And I respect all the all the people that are the workers, like all the behind the scenes folk. And I'm not trying to make any of their jobs harder. And you know, honestly, if I'm at a UFC event, uh, the days leading up to it, you're gonna find me with all those people out drinking, having something to eat. I'm friends with a bunch of them. You know, I, I'm not a person, I'm not a big shot. I don't rock star people. And I want to be a part of making whatever I'm involved in the best it could be. And that's always been the case. So I think them getting to to, to be with me hands on and face to face, like, oh, actually, this guy's all right. You know, he's, he's not going to stress us. He's not a dickhead to us. I'm going to call somebody out if they screw up and they make my life difficult because of their mistake, but I'm not gonna be like the person that's gonna just drill it into them and just never let them, it's like people make mistakes, especially when you're running as many shows a year as they do, it's all possible. I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna make it, take it personally. 
I'm gonna tell you what's unprofessional about it. You might make me mad, but that's just business. Sometimes you gotta raise your voice, but that doesn't mean, you know, to hell with that person forever. That doesn't mean treat them badly. That doesn't mean take it out on everyone else either. It doesn't mean any of that. And people are capable of making mistakes just as much as they're capable of moving past that and doing great things and being a great help to you. So, I don't know. Uh, it's just like I was up for having DC's job at one point on that Fox Sports because they were going to run. Uh, I was uh, Greenberg's choice. Mm -hmm. But they, the UFC's like, well, we want to try a couple different voices. They brought in like Misha and they brought in maybe one other and then they just, boom, nope, we're just going to go with this. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I said I had a chance at a job. But as far as I figured, they just they don't want my voice. They don't feel like I was probably the right fit for them. And honestly, I'm not owed any of that. Right. So well, I'm, the, the I'm not going like, to get mad at them over UFC it. UFC 300 is next week. And I wish, I wish we lived in a time where the legends, the pioneers, the trailblazers would be celebrated. And I saw Mark Holman is going to be brought out. And he should be brought out. Yes. But there's also 30 other people who I'd love to see sure. brought out. And you would be on that Number list 29. as well. <laughs> I'd love to see Frank Shamrock brought yeah. out. I'd love to see Randy brought out. I'd yeah, love to Maurice see Chuck, Smith. Maurice Smith, and Dan Severn, and Don Fry, and Hoyce. And maybe in time. And know, Matt Hughes. It's, it's, the UFC still exists. I know. Um, I just love to see the legends get their, their time. And, and uh, I think it's very important to remind people, because my fear is with all the new fans, who are great. I love the new fans. It's amazing. But they don't know enough about the people who built this. I don't know that it would change that even. I really feel like youngsters these days are, are very in the now and only in the now really. Um, and I'm not gonna blame them for that. I think it's a very much a symptom of the society and the way post-modernity that we live in is structured. But mm. um, besides getting into a deep philosophical and societal no, I discussion know, I here. Know. But nonetheless, I never, I went in the ring to destroy and to just annihilate. That's what I was there for, to be myself in the freest way I could be in the world. And if that meant I got a belt out of it, great. If that meant I got into a Hall of Fame, cool. But ultimately, I just do it because I'm driven to do it, and the results will speak for themselves at the end of the day. I have a good relationship with the UFC, and I have been very... Uh, I've had very good uh, um, experiences working with people like Sean Shelby, and you know, every time I see Dana, it's all good. You know, I, I get along with everybody there. Um, they've treated me well. They, I was actually very impressed with how they took care of things and all their fight roster during the pandemic and with the insane level of testing they were putting people through and making sure that people could still work in such a difficult time, uh, especially when you're a fighter and your livelihood isn't just about what you do in the day to day. Like it's, um, it's not like you show up to your job and you, you make your paycheck and, and so on and you look forward to potentially a raise and these different things. With a fighter, you fight, you, you put all this investment into getting to that fight and you get whatever you get out of that match after whatever deductions are there. Um, but it's not just about the fight or how many fights you get. There's a timeline on your ability to even ply this trade in any way that could be successful or monetarily or as a business for you whatsoever. And all of a sudden, if you are out of that ring for long enough, you know, people forget you. Your momentum is lost. Uh, that money that you won is starting to dry up. Uh, it's not just about getting the next fight for the sake of re replenishing your bankroll. It's also about building momentum, building momentum off of your training being able to use what your body is capable of giving you for the time that you have it. And you really think about it, your athletic window is like this. And if you're lucky enough, you can be fighting until you're 46 like me, but if I didn't have to, yeah, I probably still would because I love doing it. But I know that there's gonna be way less of that, if really not any more, than, uh, than there will be of everything else I'm gonna do in the world. Like, uh, you know, we just released a new lineup in the whiskey. Uh, I was just gonna plug that before we say goodbye. Yes, <laughs> let me get it, a new whiskey. Uh, it's called War 
Warbringer. What Warbringer uh, bourbon, and this is the Warmaster edition that oh, I do here. Well, uh, but even I didn't the Warbringer want to stuff, I, yes. uh, I I do. So you have warm do the blends. You have bourbon and whiskey. Well, it, it is bourbon. Okay. Bourbon is whiskey. Oh gosh, so whiskey see, being the umbrella. Oh, I see. Oh, I've just, I've just I will, exposed I will myself. I will take you on a journey of whiskey oh, someday if you allow me to. And you also have the shirts. Uh, the clothing line, warmmaterials.com? Warm Materials is, is me and my buddy uh, Adam in England. And yes, it's an MMA gear line. We Our first uh, release was a collaboration with the metal, the death metal band Amana Marth from Sweden. So their designer created all the, the artwork and everything. And we put together the, the best gear that we felt we could make for training and uh, released it out there to the world, I believe. Most all of it has sold out at this point, if not everything. Wow. Um, and we are going to be releasing a core lineup uh, some some point in the near future. Uh, we're very proud of what we're doing, and we want to bring a, a metal feel to mixed martial arts and training. And we feel like we've got the, uh, the right ability to do that from a lot of the relationships that we have. So don't be surprised if you see something from another band that, like the size or even bigger than a Monomarth. Uh, we want to bring all these people into the fold. Um, and with the, the whiskey, it's Southwest bourbon, we like to call it, because one of the initial inspirations was you have Isla scotches, which are very, very smoky, and they use peat to dry all their grains. Well, we don't have peat in the Southwest, in California, Arizona, all that area. And this whiskey is made in Oxnard. So it's, it's Southern California made and, and born. So we use what we would have, mesquite and we smoke this corn and mesquite. Uh, then we add malted rye um, as part of our mash bill. We distill it, and then we finish it in a sherry cask to give it a little extra flavor and, and sweetness to go with this big, heavy, smoky taste. And we're, we're super proud of it. We won a bunch of medals. I think the last one that Warbringer won was uh, Best Pot Still Bourbon in its, in its class for World uh, Whiskey Awards. And Warmaster Edition has the first one out the gate, which uh, originally it's just a single barrel product. So I'll pick a barrel in the warehouse. We bottle off of that, that barrel. And once that barrel is gone, once all those bottles are gone, that's it. I'll move, find another barrel that I think is worth releasing and boom, put my name on it, put it in the bottle. The first release won gold at the San Francisco International Spirits Competition, which is a pretty big deal. Wow. And uh, we followed that up with uh, the round one blend where it's cask strength. So I'm pulling these whiskeys out of the barrel. We're not uh, diluting them down in proof whatsoever. So whatever it comes out at, whatever it's blended to, that's what we release it at. And basically I just went in our Rick house, went through all these different barrels, pulled, pulled out of them, tasted every single one, took my time with them, and then just started hand blending them and playing with those, uh, with those uh, percentages until I found exactly what I wanted. And uh, we put it together and I think it's uh, 112 proof. And now we've got this round one cast strength blend put out there on the market. You just, you've just enlightened me. I, I've learned so much in just a matter of seconds well, is here. It, isn't this probably the most straightforward interview you've ever had with me? Uh, no, this is great because there's so much to get to. <laughs> I want to thank Alan Murphy. He hooked me up with all this information regarding the... Oh, he's fantastic. He is the man. Uh, but first things first, Bloodsport X tomorrow, April 4th. It's from the sold out Penn's Landing Caterers in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It's live around the world on TrillerTV.com, formerly known as Fight. And there's the poster right over there. Mm -hmm. Josh Barnett against Johnny Bloodsport. Ken, I mean, this is great stuff. Shayna Baszler making her debut. And then uh, Bloodsport Bushido, which is tremendous. That mm -hmm. lineup that you June mentioned. 22nd. June 22nd. June uh, 22nd. We, we do Tokyo. have a lineup change on this Bloodsport uh, 10 card. So originally, uh, Akira Way was going to be taking on Matt Mikowski. Uh and we also were gonna have this, this cat, Victor Benjamin, the Savage Gentleman, a Pittsburgh native. He was gonna be taking on uh, Anthony Henry, but Anthony Henry got a broken jaw. Sure. And uh, he, he's, I believe it's wired up and you know he's on the road to recovery, but obviously he won't be able to be in this match. So we're shifting the lineup a little bit. Uh, the Savage Gentleman will be taking on Akira Way. And Matt Mikowski at the moment is without a dance partner, but um, we're sure we can figure out a way to uh, to get him in the ring with somebody suitable. Oh, you up for it? 
all right. Well, you know, I mean, we want Mikowski to come out in one piece. Do you want piece. a million buys? Like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I would love that. And uh, if you hit him over the head with the uh, with the, the diamond-topped cane, yeah. that, that it would Just be saying, illegal. if you want to break the internet, speak to my agent. <laughs> Leland Nabar is his name. Uh, and you can cut a nice deal for us. Yeah. Uh, great to see you, Josh. You too, bud. Tremendous bye. stuff. Yeah. Congrats on all your success. Thank you for coming by, and good luck tomorrow. Oh, thank you very much. It's going to be a great show. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it very much. Hey, if you like this video, give us the old thumbs up. Subscribe as well. You can get many more of these videos on the channel. So please do that. We would love you forever if you did so.